and I just had to learn new things and um, just redirect my life because it just it just took everything that I knew without even saying sorry it just took it away wow. just robbed me like I waking up in the morning to an empty house exactly it's like your yeah. life has just drastically mm -hmm. changed exactly and wow. it, it was hard to take in it was hard to take in at first especially so so you have It's, it's, it's very important to, for people to talk about illnesses in the family because every time we went to the doctor, they always asked, is it, is it something that's... Because lupus is not always hereditary. Sometimes it can onset because okay. of stress or whatever um, tragedies in life or anything because we really can't pinpoint as um, scientists and researchers and a family history of autoimmune diseases, not just lupus. Because um, I would say is that we have this mentality that when you're sick and we have, the doctors haven't given you an answer, it's witchcraft. Exactly. That's the first thing that comes. Exactly. So you'll get your, but if it's like a cold, you can the, catch it. I'll catch it. Just like I'm in a plane, I have to wear a mask. I remember I was sitting um, to a, a, a young man and he was like, am I contagious? Really? Or is he? Um, oh, because you had the mask Because I had on. the, uh, okay. the mask or, um, or am I protecting myself from him? And I was like, you're right. I'm protecting myself from you because I'm in a plane and there's not a lot of ventilation here, and you hear a lot of coughing and sneezing. If I don't wear this mask, by the time I get off this plane, I will be sick. Wow. So he got, he was right away just interested to know, like, you know, what was wrong with me, and I was like, oh, it's lupus, and know that lupus um, patients suffer from a lot of fatigue, mm -hmm. and they get sick often, and things like that. So a lot of um, celebrities wouldn't come out right away to say, oh, it's lupus, because they, they don't want that liability recognition on them that, oh, well, if, you know, I'm a singer and I come out and say I have lupus, that means I'm going to cancel tours. So a lot of people don't really want to mix business with that. But the few that have come out um, are Seal. Um, he, he was... Um, known for that song, Kiss from Kiss a Rose. Kiss from was actually my yeah. favorite song. Yes, yeah. I mean, or was also married to Heidi Klum at yeah. a point. Um, he has lupus. Um, a lot of people ask, oh, so, you know, they think that his face is, wh whether it's tribal marks or he's been in an accident, um, that's lupus when it gets aggressive because lupus is an autoimmune disease that tends to attack any organs when it's aggressive. And our skin is the biggest organ. So that's what happened when his lupus was in a flare and now he has been scarred. Because wow. it, it, it's, it's, it's very, um, not only is it de debilitating, but it's very disfiguring when it attacks your skin. Wow. Another celebrity that was known to have lupus was Michael Jackson. There were a lot of pictures that would show the butterfly rash, mm -hmm. which is one of the markers where doctors easily rash. Okay. So he was known to have that a lot. And you can see it in a lot of pictures if you Google Michael Jackson and lupus, a lot of the... See that you're so full of life, you yeah. know, and I love that about you. And to see you going through some of these struggles, you yeah, know, yeah. it's the, the least I can do is, of course, support. Um, so let's talk about the content. You've been coming here for quite some time, yeah. doing some work here. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that's going. It, have you met anyone here that yes, is dealing um, with lupus? I've been an advocate in the U.S. since um, I was diagnosed. I, I, I started my advocacy journey at Montclair State University okay. where I decided to um, get the school involved to walk for lupus because I was a part of a leadership group, HRLDA, and we did things like heart walks, uh, adapt a highway. We did a lot of community service. And during that time, I was also going through my own um, struggles where my peers at college wanted to know why I, I didn't hang out with them or, you know, why I was always in my room and why I'm always saying I'm tired. So I said to myself, the best way to explain to these people is, you know, get HRLD involved in a lupus walk and then they'll get to understand what lupus is. 
and why my behavior is the way it is. Not that I'm, you know, I'm an old no, grandma or something. Yeah, you know, you <laughs> know, grandma. and I'm having my mood swings and exactly. things like that. So that they can learn exactly what I'm going through. So through that, I um, I got featured in a um, Herald News and a record um, in Montclair, and they were like, oh, wow. And I had people contacting me while I was living on campus wow. to the point where the former president of the Lupus Foundation came to the, to the school just to have a conversation with me and say, you know, you know, great job, you know, doing this because lupus need to be spoken about, exactly. you know, because he lost his daughter um, to lupus. Wow. And I was like, oh, you know, thank you. And it was through there I also organized a group on campus um, for other people suffering from autoimmune diseases in general, sort of like a support group, of you know, because when you're going to college, you go through, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's a journey that the average person would understand. What I mean by that, you have classes and you got to wake up at a certain time. You have times where you need to get paper, papers done, you know, assignments finished. And when you have lupus, your, your teeth, yes. exactly, yeah. you know. So, you know, that's what that group was about. And, you know, I, I kept pushing and he became like a, a father to me where, he, you know, he was teaching me the ropes and he said, there's another organization that I want you to join which was at the time um, Lupus um, Alliance for Lupus Research, which is now Lupus Research Alliance. Okay. And it was like, you know, go Woody Johnson started that foundation. You're into biology and you want to do research. I think that would be a great organization for you to join. So I did and I became uh, a committee member and also one of the speakers for um, Lupus Research Alliance. And kept buildings and, and getting the training of advocacy. While I was doing that, I also was hearing that other patients in Ghana was getting diagnosed. So it, it became an interest of mine to find out how they're coping here. Um, are they getting enough education? Um, what is the country doing about it? And, you know, when I came, my heart was broken. Hmm. Why? My heart was broken because I saw patients that were going through hell. Because one, the resources are not here. Colleges. So the doctors, there was the, the the resources is limited here. The doctors are limited. So I was just burdened. And you know, as human beings, the first thing that we are supposed to be is of service. So I was like, you know, how can I change this situation? How can I help this situation? So I became on a quest for statistics because in order for Ghana to get funding, we need stats. Of course, yeah. And it's been a struggle, but God is so good that I can say that this year we finally made um, good. a step, good. Um, you know, towards the future in, in the quest for talk about, statistics. Talk about some of the struggles, because I mean, I know firsthand that yeah. coming across stats is just really challenging mm -hmm. on this continent. Yeah, you know? yeah. So they don't keep it. Yeah, let's talk about some of the challenges that you faced and how maybe you wish easier to help you, you know, further the awareness that you're hoping to create. I, I, when I first came, I did a few, <clears throat> I did a few TV um, prior to whole the North. He, he mentioned all of them. And I was like, I'm, I'm on a quest for statistics. And he said, you know, I'll do my best to help you. But we need national numbers. So it's been back and forth between the Ministry of Health, Ghana Health Services. All these years I come. And finally, um, I had a meeting the other day um, with Director General. And, he, and they have, are putting in a plan to um, send a letter out um, to the public um, hospitals, the private um, hospitals and clinics, so we can finally tally up numbers for Ghana. Good. So Good. all that hard work. Oh, Starting so there were times I just wanted to just pull my eyebrows out. I can out imagine. I because can imagine. it was just so difficult, and I'm like, I'm here, I'm trying to help. I don't have to, yeah. because I'm in a, a country where resources are easy for me to assess, but my heart couldn't take the fact that somebody else in my condition didn't have the help that I have. So I was like, 
I definitely have to do something about trip this. alone. That's I've been, passion. I've been, I've been going through so much on this trip. I, I mean, I was even just telling my cousin this more shows after today because I'm tired and all the different surgeries I've had, I've developed sciatica and I've developed tendonitis. So at the end of the night, I'm barely moving. Of course. Others getting the help that they need. And that's, that's why I do what I do because at the end of the day, when you're focusing on helping others, whatever you're going through no longer becomes an issue. Matter, exactly. Yeah. And I constantly share my story because I want the next person to know that you're not alone, that somebody else out there is dealing with what you're dealing with. And you shouldn't live by stigma, but rather be vocal. Not because people will understand what you're going through, but at least they can show some type of compassion or sympathize exactly. with you. Exactly. It's like what you did in university. Had yeah, you yeah. not come yeah, out yeah. to say anything, people ha would have speculated. Yeah, because and made people, up their people, own. people were having a hard time with exactly. me. They were even calling me Mother of Teresa. Course. <laughs> you know, exactly. you know, your peers are your biggest yes. um, critics. Yes. They're calling me Mother it's Teresa. True. You, you, you it's never want to do anything. It's you know, true. type of thing. But. I knew who I was, I know how much my body can take, and I knew I can't be the average person. So I'm, I make that very known. I'm sorry, I need to cancel on yeah. you. That's just who I am. Okay. Don't take offense to it. It's something that I'm dealing with, not you. Yeah, yeah. and I'm sure those who know what you're dealing with understand, yeah. you know? So it's not... Not, not necessarily. I, I would say, besides my peers, I tend to deal with a lot of family members who don't they understand. They don't understand. And it becomes an issue or they'll take it personal. Interesting. Yeah, they'll take it personal because they're not understanding exactly what you're going through and they, they go off a tangent that if you're feeling good today, then tomorrow sh you should be the same. Along, as soon as you tell them, oh, I'm not feeling well, oh, you're sick again. Of like, course. you know, it's very, it, it, it's, it's, it, yeah. it, it gets very frustrating. And I tend to shy away from fans that behave like that. Because they don't understand and they're not trying to understand. They're not trying you know, to understand because I keep themselves. saying every day is not the same. I, I can have a good day today, but the next day I want to be in bed. Be the same. And another thing with, you know, patients who suffer from any type of autoimmune disease, you know, the fatigue level is so much that if you have a great day today, say I was able to knock out three or four things and get it done, I'll pay for it. In, for th in like about three days. It would take me about three day resting period wow. just for me to bounce back wow. from that one day where I was able to accomplish so much. So it, people just do not understand. But all I ask is for you to cope with me. Exactly. Just cope with me. I'm glad to hear that you're mm -hmm. making headway here in Ghana. Yeah. So like what networks, what have you been able to, mm -hmm. what do you think is different from this trip than the last trip? Because the last trip, I know it was frustration, trying to oh, every connect with the right people. Every trip has been challenging. Um, every trip has been challenging, but a learning experience. And last year, what made this trip a little different from last year is um, last year I had a conversation with Sangoon Daly, and he was like, Judith, you're doing the awareness. You, you, you know, you're on radio, you're on TV. Push towards the statistics. Push towards, the, and he was like, instead of, you know, lead, leaning on the Ministry of Health and trying to go through them, go through Ghana Health Services. And that was the, the game changer. Good. So that became my focus and kept the conversation going. Even after I left the country, the constant emails, the phone calls, back and forth, back and forth, until I came back, and now finally a step towards, you know, the right direction. Finally. Yeah. Finally. So who are some of the people that you can say now are helping you to, to move things along? Well, as I mentioned, Professor um, Edmund Daly. Okay. Um, Dr. Day has also been of help. Okay. Um, when I was um, having the meeting with um, the U.S. Ambassador, Robert Jackson, I called the administration, and he commended me for what I was doing because I, I don't have to. Again, I'm in the U.S. where resources are not limited in any, any shape or form. 
and you know he wanted to help but how can he help without numbers we believe in numbers the statistics so um, he was also um, invited um, USAID um, Nora Mitch and it, she also said the same thing if we can get the numbers then we can find out the way to best fund um, people here in Ghana because as we are speaking the National Health Insurance Scheme doesn't support the patients and I took offense to it until recently I spoke to Does former lupus patients? yes um, I, I was like why why you know because there's a great number here even though we haven't gotten the statistics with the patients and the histories of the patients that I've gotten to know it's a great number here we just need to be able to publish it and I took offense to it I was like how can you guys support other illnesses and not lupus and I had a conversation with uh, former um, His Excellency Kufo, and he explained to me, it's like, it's not that they've been excluded um, purposely, it's just that it's still struggling. It's still struggling. So now that we're uh, moving a, a step forward in to trying to find these statistics, once the statistics have been published, then we'll know the greater need that funding must be given to these patients. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So so strides have been made. I mean oh, strides yeah, have yeah, been made. Yeah. I know it has not been easy. I no, know. It no, no. And you know, I've had I've had a few um, other supporters, especially um, GTV has been on my side from the beginning. Um, T V three has been on my side as well. Um, there's there's been other um, Shows like um, with Norte Dua, he's okay. he's done interviews so with me. So the media has been supportive. They've, the media has been supportive, yes. and now, of course, the association of African of Exactly. Just um, the other day, I did a show with um, City FM nice. um, on TV, and you know, it it's, it's social service. It's social service. So you know, anytime I get a chance to get on any of these um, um, media platforms, help me raise awareness here in Ghana. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's great work that you're doing. Yeah. It's great work. It's not been easy. And I just, I like that you've not given up because obviously oh. it means, it means a lot. And you'll get there. You know, yeah, you'll yeah. get there. So now we have come to the end of our program. Yeah. And thank you so much for being on here and just, just sharing insights, you yeah. know, about lupus. Tell us, you have a nonprofit organization. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So tell us how people can get involved, get in contact with you. You're yeah, also yeah. doing a fundraiser. Mm, yes. How yes. can people donate to that? Yes, I um, started two nonprofits. Um, the first one I started because of my background story, where living in the U.S., I mentioned resources, and um, at the age of 18, I was I was no longer un, uh, able to get state insurance, wh which was Medicaid at that time, and I couldn't be under my mother's insurance. And I saw what she was going through financially, paying for my medications, until. A family friend said, hey, there's uh, resource centers. Even if you can't, you know, be under Medicaid, you know, look into that. And I went to those places, and I found out there was help out there. And I kept meeting more people who were also suffering from autoimmune illnesses generally, not just lupus, Crohn's. And they also were struggling with the same thing that I was. They got to a certain age that, you know, state insurance was no longer supporting them. This, this is in the era before Obamacare, or what we call Affordable Care Act. And learning about these resource centers, I realized that the, the big foundations also they didn't know that these places existed. So that's where I said, I needed to start a nonprofit organization so I can lead patients towards education, one, and also resources. Because what I've learned in my journey through lupus is that let your medicine be your food and your food be your medicine. What I mean by that is changing my lifestyle helped with a lot of the symptoms that I was getting. Okay. It helped f for them to basically not just disappear, but they weren't ongoing like it was before exactly. because exactly. I learned better ways of eating. Okay, so like there are some natural exactly. remedies that yes. you can you, use you, to help. You know, I had my scientific background, but I also, you know, started doing my own research thing. I realized when I ate things that had dairy, I didn't feel well. Or when I eat something that has yeast inside, so I stay away from breads. 
And, you know, so I also had to learn to stay away from some of our local foods because kenke tend to have yeast. Wow. So, you know, Ugh, I couldn't, wow. exactly, I couldn't, like, quit it just, you know, all, just like that, yes. you know, cold turkey. Once in a while, you sneak it in, <laughs> you know, but it, it, exactly, you know, I have to live. Yes. But it's, it's not something you make your regular diet. So I, I started learning these things, and, I, you know, I felt better. So anytime I had a conversation with a person who was also dealing with autoimmune, I was like, try to eliminate gluten, try to eliminate yeast, try to eliminate dairy and see how you feel. And they always come back and say, I'm feeling better. Wow. So again, th even though we don't know exactly what causes it, there are things that we can do, you know, to change the course of whatever that we're going through as far as, you know, autoimmune, because there are food triggers. Interesting. There are food triggers. Because I remember when I was having a conversation with one of my dogs, he was like, oh, you're, you'll just be fine. Eat regular. That's so, not no, true. I can't. I can't yeah, eat regular. No, because like I, I, like, I, I self-care before doctors of care. Of course. You know, you got to know yourself. Of you got to know exactly when Rita is not feeling well. Of course. You got to know when Rita eats fufu, she doesn't feel good. Once you learn know those things body. about yourself, know your, body. know your body, learn things to take out your diet or what all you have to, and I tell patients all the time, I said, all you have to do is eat your um, affirmations and exactly. be like, oh, I'm going to get through this, exactly. you know, mind, body, spirit, you, you have to do it exactly. all. It takes exactly. all that if you want to heal. Exactly. Well, thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining us today. Mm -hmm. You know, I definitely appreciate, I mean, I think you're one of the strongest women mm -hmm. I know. You know, you're so courageous, and it's just been a pleasure having you here and, mm -hmm. and getting to hear your side of the story mm -hmm. and letting, you know, educating our people on, on lupus. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, you hear all the time about malaria, mm -hmm. you know, when in some cases it may not be malaria. Yeah. You know, so now hopefully if you've tuned in and you're watching, you have an idea what some of the symptoms are of lupus. So make sure that if you go to a doctor, get a second opinion, get a third opinion, until they've narrowed down what, what the, the issue is. Um, again, today I have been your host, Rita Kusi, mm -hmm. for AAU Talks, and I was joined by Professor Judith Mills. And thank you, our viewers, for tuning in. and welcome to yet another edition of AAU Impact Stories. This season we are celebrating academic mentors. I am your regular host, my name is Ransford Beckham. Today we shall be celebrating or featuring a female academic in the Republic of Ghana. Let's go for a very short break and when we come back we shall hear more about her Lawrence. Please stay tuned in. The Association of African Universities in partnership with the All African Students Union and Al Azhar University Egypt calls on African universities to participate in the first African Universities Olympics. Theme Uniting African Universities through Sports and Recreation. Mapping out strategies to achieve the Africa we want. The disciplines include basketball, football, long jump, triple jump, shot put, javelin, sprints, and a whole lot more. 
The teams will be formed according to the five geopolitical regions of Africa, namely West, East, South, North and Central Africa. Venue, Al Azhar University, Cairo, Egypt. Date, 14th to 18th of March 2019. Register now on blog.aau.org and also stand the chance of visiting the pyramids of Giza and other interesting sites in Cairo. For more information, visit blog.aau.org or call plus 233-24. Three two nine eight four six four. Welcome, my viewers, to AAU Impact Stories, where we have been celebrating academic mentors. Today, I have with me a person, an academic icon from the Republic of Ghana, who is the first female chancellor of Women's University in Africa, which is in Zimbabwe. She was a former Minister of Education in the Republic of Ghana from January 2013 to January 2017, and a former Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, and incidentally, the first female Vice Chancellor of a public university in Ghana. And she was Vice Chancellor for four years from 2012 to 2016. Viewers, follow this discussion on our social media handles and on AAU TV. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Jane Nana Opoku Ajuma. This is AAU in Pastoralism. and we're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. We have gone through your lengthy CV and ideally we don't know where to start from. You were the first female chancellor of a private university in Zimbabwe and I believe you are the third chancellor but the first female. So how did you feel when you were called upon to serve as a chancellor at Women's University in Africa? Um, actually if my record said me right then there was a female before me. Okay. So we just put that right. Um, okay. In terms of how I felt uh, it's just one of life's surprises okay. because you know to become chancellor uh, is not a position that is advertised mm. it is not something you compete for it is not something you apply for it is like an honor bestowed on you and therefore it makes you feel humble it makes you feel um, I, I think it's, it's a kind of complex feeling okay. because yes you feel happy you feel humbled and you ask yourself, so who knows about me? How did this happen? Oh. And so on. You know, it raises many questions for you. Okay. But I think that finally it puts you in the spotlight and it reminds you that um, many people are looking at what you are doing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so when you were given that award, or oh, sorry, that confirmed it, is there any term to it? Is it a, a yes. five-year term? Yeah, or? it's a three-year term renewable. Okay. Renewable. Yes, and okay. it is quite standard. Oh. Um, in Ghana, I know that our chancellors are given five years renewable. Okay. Yeah, so. So what is expected of you as a chancellor? You know, as a chancellor, you are not the CEO. Okay. So you don't play administrative roles, direct administrative roles, because the university has its own structure. Uh, there's a council in place, and in case of the Women's University in Africa, there is a board of trustees in place. Then you have your uh, the usual um, Senate, Academic Board, Departmental, Faculty Board, you know, they all do the work. Mm -hmm. So as the Chancellor, you are more or less like part of the face of the university. Okay, so the brand ambassador. Something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very It's an much. award that the whole of Ghana was really proud to have one of our own crossing over see. all over <laughs> to Zimbabwe to there have that go. conferred on you, especially yeah. the Association of African Universities where you once served as a board member. Yeah. So on behalf of AAU, we say a big congratulations. Thank you very much. And let me say that many people are part of the match, you mm. know. Uh, every step you take adds to your experience and to your outcomes. So 
it is not a road you travel by yourself. So I acknowledge the sentiments of the AAU, but I also want to say that AAU is also part of it. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, in the promotion of academic freedom, yes. we know that you were a Minister of Education in the elsewhere administration. Yes. Assuming such a confirmant had come in your host country, Ghana, when your government is not in power, would you have picked up that position in a public university? No, it is an expression of honor. Somebody is respecting you, somebody is honoring you. I see no reason why you don't want to accept it, unless you have very personal reasons why, you know, that is not a wise decision. That's very wise decision. Right. Mm -hmm. That's very good. So academics promote academic freedom. <laughs> and so our academic freedom should be expressed everywhere, irrespective of second in Ghana. Yes. And you stayed on for four years. Yes, I did. That was a wonderful achievement because in a country like Ghana, there are often ministerial reshuffles, but you managed to sail through for four years. So what is the secret behind what you did? I mean, what maintained you in that position? Well, um, again, it's a position I was invited to accept. Uh, when my vice chancellorship had been over and I had other options. But weighing the options and those options lay outside of my country. Um, it became like, you know, like there was no choice. I mean, how do you go building systems elsewhere if your country has expressed mm, that you could be of help? And actually, I didn't go there determined to stay for four years. I went there determined to do the best I could. And I was happy that the offer was going to play to my strengths as somebody in education. If I'd been offered to go into security, of course, <laughs> I'd immediately have said, really, I, I, you know, I have no clue or th that kind of thing. Uh, so I just went in there determined to do the best I could, and that is the attitude with every position I take. Mm. If I feel that for any reason I cannot work to, my, to the best of my ability, I will not accept it. So, you know, like maybe in church, being a member of this group or the choir, I know I won't be there. I admire those who will be there, so I will not join. Because why should I join and cause trouble for other people? I'm not going to be able to come there for practice and be part of the group. So you find what other things you can do and do well instead of, you know, being a member and being an absentee member for everything. Okay, now what were some? Okay, just a I'll few. talk about the highs, okay. or maybe I'll begin with the lows. Um, it, it is to recognize the enorm enormity of the problem. Mm. You have a sense, of course, you have ideas, you have read the reports, but then it, it is when you actually go to the ground and you see the seriousness of what it is that you are facing. Um, I remember reading a report about um, teacher absenteeism in this country and the report had been done by UNICEF and when I saw that the percentage national was 27% I almost panicked. 27 because, is quite high. Yes, because coming from the university I couldn't imagine 27% of the lecturers not showing up at all. No, what would the students do? What would the outcomes be? Oh, was there a report on the higher education or it was no, on education? It was on, no, it was on basic education. Basic education, okay. So, um, first I told myself, really, is this possible? You know, what accounts for this? How do we deal with this? So you try assumed for, office. before I assumed office. Okay. So that was one huge challenge. Um, another huge challenge was to look at the outcomes of the education after maybe so many years of uh, basic education, what have our children become? What have the young learners become? Why are they not able to move up? What are the issues? Again, so you need to look at teacher quality, you need to look at the uh, teacher training, you need to look at parental input, community support, you need to look at the children themselves, you need to look at the syllabus. You need to look at the availability of teaching and learning materials and the, 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 the quality of life in the community. So many things yeah. come into play. Yeah. 
But then, you know, once you see that there are challenges, the next step is, how do I turn these challenges into opportunities? Exactly. How do I ensure that we are all overcoming these challenges and making sure that we are leaving the terrain in a little better shape than we found it? So those were some uh, of okay. the challenges at the basic level. Okay. At the secondary level also, you notice that there was quite a huge percentage of, uh, of children who by our own admission had passed, they were not in school. And yet you also knew that there were some schools that were not full. So, you know, what are the issues? Mm. And then you know also that, why have we prioritized non-technical education to the extent that uh, we are creating that false impression that somebody is going into vocational technical school because he couldn't make it somewhere else. Yeah. And yet we, as a nation, we know that we cannot continue to produce and export primary materials, I mean primary commodities forever, when the community prices are not determined by us and your president is forever talking about uh, adding value. So then you ask yourself, so when the president says that we need to add value, and I normally call my deputy ministers and ask them, so what do, okay. you, think, no, what do you think this means for us mm. in education? Maybe other people in other ministries may be having other conversations. But for us, what does it mean? Yeah. We are a huge part. Actually, we are the major part of training in this country. So what should we do? You know, so those were very interesting uh, moments. challenges yeah, and okay. moments. Okay. And then in the higher education sector, oh, yeah. in the, the challenge is the major, major worry is research. Other, mm. if you are in, if you are focusing on higher education, you should be very interested in basic education. If you are focusing on technical education, you should be very interested in primary education mm. because it begins somewhere. Exactly. And you know, it's it's like the it's a back and forth. There you linkages. go. Yeah, like mm. a machine. You yes. know, the parts moving mm. in tandem with each other. Exactly. So that is why you look at them. These divisions are made for sake of planning, for sake of, of upward uh, mobility, but they are not like ends in themselves. Okay. Okay. Even when they leave the university, they're also going to the workplace. Mm. So you should also be interested in finding out what the employers are saying about the people living in the Trees are steady. You see? Yeah, so very uh, critical. each one should be linked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, is the education minister a cabinet member yes okay yes you are in cabinet okay. you, yes you so, are so, so your voice is heard by the top level of uh, leaders yes okay and it should be okay. um and you've been appointed by the president exactly. and you will give um periodic briefs okay and so he's on top of what is happening yeah. and um he also knows what you are doing if there's any input and if you need anything special from him or whatever it is, you know, you should maintain that like dialogue. Yeah. Okay, so you so will talk about the achievements later. Yes, well, no, in <laughs> fact, I'm interested in just one achievement per structure from the oh, basic to the okay, tertiary. Then, okay, one that's going to be tough, but because I'll they try. are numerous. Uh, yes, they, they are many. Mm. Uh, at the preschool level. Uh, we increase the number of structures and the number of teachers. That's very important. The percentage was low because it had been formalized not too long ago. So it was one area we really needed to pay attention to. And in connection with that, we have selected seven of the colleges of education to focus on preschool training. You know, preschool had been, before then it had been handled through the Ministry of Social Welfare. Lots of people didn't know that. Mm. And therefore, the training of the teachers had also come from a different quarter. They've done well in the past, okay. but now this is on our hands. What do we do? And in fact, I was even thinking that we should go further. I wanted to see a whole college of education dedicated to preschool. To preschool. And so that they'll also have a practice school. And that practice school should be architectured to fit the preschool. And that can serve as a model to private participants in preschool education to see what it should be like. Because if you go around a lot of, um, of preschools in this country, and I've, I've traveled around the country and visited thousands of 
schools, you notice that yes, it's my house to the environment. And you just look at my wall, you may feel it's low. But if the child is too, how high is the child? So if you can put yourself in the child's shoes, then it's like the lowest window is above your head. How would you feel? You see, we don't think about these things, but we should. Yeah, it is the adult that should adjust to the child's environment and not the other way around. Yeah, so even the steps, everything there should be designed to fit. It, it also needs to link up with the architect. So you see, we have our tentacles yeah. everywhere. Mm. So in terms of primary ed, sorry, preschool. Preschool. Then in terms of primary ed, when we took over, when I came into the ministry in 2013, our research showed that um, the, the textbook to people ratio was one textbook to three children. Right. Yes. One book to so, three uh, children. Is that adequate? Absolutely not adequate. Okay. So one of the first things we did was to increase that textbook ratio. Okay. So we increased it to the level where every child has four books. That is in a public institution. Yes, okay. instead of one book to three, three children, children, now four books to, to one, one child. Wow, that is marvelous. Yeah, because you see, you must also think of the children and the three children sharing. One book. So why are we surprised that the outcome is not as good yeah. as it ought to be? Yeah. How about the teacher? So the teacher takes one, and with all these kids in the classroom and not adequate teaching and learning materials, what atmosphere will pervade in the school? So why are you saying that teacher is screaming at the children? What have you done to ensure that the, the voice level is low, no. is acceptable, the kids are not fighting over any book, and there's an atmosphere for learning? Mm -hmm. So that will be for the um, primary school. When we go to the junior high school, there were many things, but the one thing I would like to emphasize will be the opportunity we created for, um, for reset. You know, even at the university, when you are an adult and all of that, and something went wrong, there's always an opportunity for you to rewrite yeah. your paper. Yeah. That's not to say that there was no opportunity for reset at the basic level. To go back to his old school and write the exam with his juniors, as an adult, it doesn't matter. Yes. But not as a teenager. But as a, you see, the mind hasn't developed to the level where you feel that, oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's only for a few. So you notice that the percentage of children who were going back to rewrite was so low. So then you ask yourself, where are the rest of the kids? Let us say that if you finish GHS, let's say five years ago, we'll put aside your continuous assessment. You go to, we'll create centers for you to come and rewrite your paper and we will use only the results of that. The, the exams. I think it's only fair. I think it is. Because you see, if you lose them at that stage, picking them up becomes a Very huge difficult. problem. Yes. And it needn't be that way. Mm. So we introduced this, and I remember going to the center in Accra, and then the following day going to the center in Tamale, and it was most touching. Wow. Parents there, some in you have to be used. Yes. In our universities and other tertiary institutions. Rewriting, yeah, no, no. everybody avoids it, but it's not yeah. such, such a big deal. But it's a loss yeah. to everybody. And so, if you come to the secondary level, uh, I'm proud to announce that for the four years we were there, we made history in work. What is the history? The, the results are there. You can go Marvelous. to work and check. Ghana topped all the time. Yeah. And in fact, the last one was even phenomenal. You know, normally it's three places, and it used to be maybe Ghana, Nigeria, Gambia. Maybe Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone. Maybe Ghana, Ghana, Nigeria. Oh, but it was Ghana, Ghana, Ghana throughout. And the last one it was Ghana, 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 from one school. From one school? From one school. And, everyone, and it was really touching that that has seen it fit to ask me to say the government had made a point. And then when you come to the tertiary level, yes. we raise the level of polytechnics to technical universities. Now this is very, very important. If you are saying technical education is important, and you are training people who are coming for jobs that machines are doing, you need to sit up. Exactly. 
you should know there'll be unemployment, even of the educated, because of the education they were getting, the work they were supposed to do that was being picked by machines. So you need to raise the level. Okay? Yeah. And at the same time, if it's not everybody who has the qualifications to do the degree, they can do the certificates, they can do the diplomas. So all the three levels existed okay. at the technical level. Yeah. And really, you needed to raise the level of technical education. Mm -hmm. You cannot continue to train lower level, lower level. No. This is the 21st century. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's the 21st century. It's already now 19 years gone. And you cannot now begin to train for the 21st century. The 21st century is already here with you. So what does it imply for education? Okay, so after that, the universities, we got the World Bank Centers of Excellence. Yes. We competed for them. We got two centers at Legon. We got one in tech. So at every level, I think we made some impact. And there's a time to thank everyone. It's not me alone. It's my deputies, it's the government itself, it's the president. He gave us all the support, all the respect, all the space to be able to make that, to be able to do the best that we could. Viewers, we've been talking to <laughs> Professor Jinana Opoku Ajiman, and this is AU Impact Stories. Please stay tuned in as we go for a very short break. What do you think about when you think of success? Success is about hard work. Success is it for the good of the community. Success is about skills development. It's about creating innovative ideas and building a hope and making it a reality. Success is about having big dreams and chasing them. Success is nurtured here. We as National University of Science and Technology stand as the only key you can use to unlock doors for success. When you think of success, think in other terms. Welcome back viewers to AAU Impact Stories where we are celebrating Professor J. Nana Upuku Ajima on celebrating academic mentors. This is a professor who has four honorary degrees. You have a Doctor of Law from the University of the West Indies, Doctor of in North Carolina, Doctor of Humane Letters from Grand Valley State University, Doctor of Letters from University of Cape Coast. She is an honorary fellow, Commonwealth of Learning. She's a leading women's achievers. She has a leading women's achievers award. She has a global leadership award from University of South Florida. She has a Ghana Women of Excellence Award and several, several, several awards. Significantly, our celebrant <laughs> seems to like the month of October. Why am I saying this? She was the first female of a public university in Ghana in October 2012. She was the chancellor, or she was made a chancellor of Women's University in Africa in October 2018. She became Ghana's representative on the executive board of UNESCO in October 2009. Madam, what is special about October to you? <laughs> Well, I wish I, d I decided those days, but I didn't. You didn't. But actually, October is very important for me because my first child was born in October. Wow. But I, I don't think there's any connection <laughs> between there's that. A, this is marvelous. Now, let's talk about your appointment as the Vice Chancellor of UCC in October 2012. Yeah. And as the, female vi the first female Vice Chancellor. Yes. How did you break through the ranks? I know there may have been other competitors who may likely have been males. How did you do it? Yes, you were right. At uh, the time of the um, application process leading to the interviews, yes, there were five other males and myself. Five other males? Yes. But I don't think um, that that was very important. I'd like to believe that the panel was looking for uh, a vice chancellor that at all. Um, yes, I applied for it, something I wanted to do. I'd been at the University of Cape Coast all my working life. 
I'd been everything I needed to be from warden to head of department to dean to founding the School of Graduate Studies and Research. I'd been on, on the boards and committees and all of that. And I was convinced that no, this university could move in a different direction or could move faster uh, than we were doing. And it was that conviction that propelled me to apply and to compete for that position. Actually, for all the things I've ever done, this is the one I consciously applied for and I competed for. Yeah. And I was glad that I got it. And so, were you a fulfilled person when you had it? You know, when you have it, it's the beginning, so you don't get fulfilled yet. <laughs> Ooh. It's the beginning. Okay. Yes, you wanted the position, now you have it. But then I had a vision, I had a vision statement, I had my strategy, you know, I had all these things laid out. One of the first things I did was to call a meeting of all the competitors, all of us, because I had never believed that I'm the sole repository of anything. Everybody has something to, to, to offer. Do, and everybody, every other person could also have been um, appointed. So I thought I should first of all listen collaborate with, learn from, and I think that that helped a lot. That helped me. Yes, mm. but again, to stay focused, mm. uh, you need to know why you are there, and what do you think you can do in the face of your challenges, and I stayed the course. And my major, major concern is university is for scholarship. University is to generate knowledge, you generate knowledge and you share, and you keep your eye on where you are going, where the society is going, where the nation is going, and why, you know, the fundamental question for me was, why should the state fund you? Why should the state use money to support a university? a university? That was an entrepreneurial university. Well, if, you know, why, why was the rationale? Okay. There has to be a reason for it. Yeah. What is that reason? Find it and fulfill that. Okay, yes, you are training people, that's important. So they should be of quality. Who is doing the training? What support do the training to the trainers need? What are the facilities we are using for training? The university can do so many other things, but what makes you a university? What is a university? You know, so those theoretical fundamental questions will help you to strategize, will help you to hone your own vision and mission, and it will help to create the pathways for you to achieve those aims. If so, you have a young, a pool of young people who have had, who have done their masters, or, or you know, PhDs. they need yeah. So what should happen? And you've been established since 1962. Um, what should you be now? Where should you be? And where where should you be going? You know. So those were some of the fundamental questions. And uh, so in terms of financial sustainability of the University of Cape Coast, how did you manage that? The, you have a lot of time because I'll tell you a long story. Okay. We are here uh, for you. Thank you very much. You know, when I came, when I joined the University of Cape Coast, about two years later, I was made the whole warden of Adisha Hall. And before then, I was a counselor, so I wasn't paying much attention to the budget or anything. But as whole warden, it hits you. Hey, this is the money we are getting for um, a term. And you realize that this money cannot clean the bathrooms properly for a term. So what do you do? Are you going to stay in the filth? Are you know, what is it? So you start mobilizing. You start fundraising. And I remember very, very well going to the head of chemistry then, the late Professor Datsun, and saying, give me a list of the girls who are studying chemistry in this university. And I asked them, so what does it make to, what does it take to create soap. You were in chemistry. You know, so you play to your strengths. Why do our toilet bowls, excuse me, look the way they do? What chemicals should we make to clean them? You know, so I believe in drawing on your strengths. And I believe there's always something you have, however small. You identify that thing and make it big. Okay. And at that time, the, the top roof, I mean the roof of, the, of course at the top floor was leaking so badly that those who stayed at the top floor couldn't live there when it rained. The investor didn't have money. 
We fundraised and we, we ruined the entire hall. How did you fundraise? Interesting. You see, I never went to the big people. I told them me, I, I, I'm in a Ferrazi. I don't <laughs> want to go beg. So I remember it was one step at a time. First, we wanted to create a conducive environment in the hall for counseling to take place. We had a counseling room, but it looked to me like a confession room. You know, there's a desk, a chair here. That, which student is coming to tell you their problems in an environment like that? Why don't you make it look like a nice living room with a fridge, like they've gone to their, you know. And I remember going to Ikuyaba, and if you are listening, thank you very, very much. They gave us a nice set of living room furniture, and we put it there. And I remember going to, I come from Commander. There was this carpenter in Commander, Patom, if you are listening. Patom made us two nice bookshelves. And we put them there. You know, so everybody has something small to offer. And I remember when we ended up with uh, Gassem. Again, we want to thank Gassem about uh, the, material Gassen for, the material for our roofing. We let the development office give us everything we needed. And we broke it down even into 10 nails. If you can give us 10 nails, it's okay. So you are in charge of the nails and you keep counting until we have the nails that we needed. You know, so we did that. So we went to uh, Gassem and they promised to give us the cement at factory price. So I don't go saying give me money. People don't have money. And they work hard for their money. Why should they give it to you? But they may have a bit of the item they can give you. Okay, so that was at the back of my mind. And when I became vice chancellor again, we never have enough money. I don't say anybody ever does. So what, what I was saying that at the time, we had about 17,000 students on campus and another 35,000 distance. In distance education. And I said, you know, if you look at those of us on campus alone, 17,000 students, and if you count the workers and the lecturers and so on, you look at about 21,000, 21,000 people that this nation thinks are bright. On the average, the students, you pick them from those who qualified. The lecturers have their PhDs and all these fine degrees. We can't stay here and be poor and then march to the government every day and beg for money. What should the people of the, the villages around us do? So I said, no, let us generate our own income. We had the School of Agriculture doing a fantastic job. We opened, you know, they were already serving the community. We were already processing uh, meat. So how do we expand our marketing? How do we even expand, the, you know, the small place, the small kiosk where they are selling the vegetables? How do we expand it and then advertise to the larger community? Okay? And I just used three things. I said, number one, water. Remember those days, I think some company, I don't want to mention their name, had advertised their spring water and they were having a bit of a problem. And I said, we live near Kakum. You know, so why can't we bottle our own water? And I remember it was graphic, my own graphic, which the following day, I think I said this during the graduation ceremony, my first, and they said, oh, the vice chancellor is going to produce and sell pure water. You know, so you don't allow these things to discourage you. Okay. Because I just said, all of us on this campus, we have a department of chemistry that can keep testing the quality of water. Why can't we be the biggest producer for oh. others to come and buy? And we have a school of business. We always say we want them to go outside and do practical work. Why can't you create the practical work on campus so the smaller businesses in town can also send their people to us? I thought that's what the university should do. So now you see, we have the bottled water like this one, and the University of Cape's logo is on it. And I'm so happy, and I'm so proud. The second item was paper. Everybody's office is choking with exam scripts, and you know, some 10 years, the rule is that you should keep the papers for five years, okay. then you can destroy them. Yeah. But you can't burn paper. We had a printing press, and what would then? So we said, how can we convert this paper? into other into products. Yeah. Assuming we converted them into tissue paper for our washrooms, why should anybody come to the university washroom and not see tissue paper there? Why can't we produce this? So of course we created a big warehouse. 
and bought a shredder. And every was it Tuesdays and Thursdays we sent the truck around to people were happy to get rid of the papers. Oh. So we did ours. Then we went to Winnipeg and got their paper. Then we got to Legon. Legon got to know what we're doing. They said they'll do their own. Anyway, that's a long, another thing. So that's the paper thing. And then the final one was was liquid soap, which I had already started with the additional people years back. So UCC now has their own water. We have our own liquid soap. I think the paper has not reached the stage. But I wanted the tissue paper, paper plates, paper cups. Can we put water dispensers around the lecture theater and get people to drink water? I know, things like that. And you're also generating income. Mm. And maybe others that... Uh... We, was, we are talking to a woman <laughs> of vision. And one thing I know about November bombs are that they are innovative, oh. they have a noble spirit, and they are strong-willed. Oh. <laughs> but I you can know, see that but, you. But you're saying that you know, I got a lot of support. Because I remember that for the chemistry, for this whole thing, I got a group of young um, lecturers in the science faculty. And they bought into the idea. So all I did was to stay back and simply push them to be able to do this. Yes, but it's your vision. Ah, well. You have the vision, the yeah. passion. Well, yes. that too. And I yes. thought that the university could work towards becoming self-sufficient. Okay. So with this fund, not only, I mean, with, this, with these initiatives, not only are we giving our business students places to, uh, that, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we, we have them the opportunities. Whole, we, we have Bcom, for God's sake. Yes, but we have a school this. of business. How can we stay here and be poor? So, what are we training our students to do? You know, so let them see that the change is possible here, and then maybe they can take their ideas um, elsewhere. So, that way, we can also create our own research fund. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. We can create proper student aid resources. Some of our students are struggling. Yes, they have the student loan. How about, how about even funding initiatives by students? How about funding initiatives by faculties? Yeah. But how will you do it? So if you can generate your own income, you can do more of this. Before they were generating quite a lot through distance education, but again, I thought we should put a lot of money back into distance education simply because you are the first in anything. I think it should rather bring you responsibility. Others are coming along. Hello. Today, so many people are offering distance education. What makes our program still distinctive? Because distance education calls from a different methodology of teaching. And so you must fund those who have gone through it to get higher degrees. You know, it's the quality of the human input. That makes a difference. So you shouldn't lose sight of that. Do you think the four-year term was too short for you at the University of Cape Coast? Oh. Because so what, you, you have the passion, you have the vision, yeah, and but some of the initiatives had not been fulfilled, like the paper you, you thing see, that you You, you cannot be in any place forever. Yes, but the four-year term... What matters is what you do with the time you have. In, any tracking or monitoring of what you left? Oh, yes. I'm always very interested in what is happening. Okay. You know, um, somebody may come continue or not, that's not important. But then. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet. With our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming machines and others, you are sure to get the best of production. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Legon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board or contact the AAU studio via the following addresses. Info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on 0244-185-998 or 0244-6 Welcome back viewers to AU Impact Stories where we are celebrating Professor Jainana Upuku Ajiman. Professor has a lot of publications but before we talk about her publications she, she is also very passionate about the diaspora. I think she had served as a director at the University of Cape Coast that looked into 
um, the diaspora uh, activities. And significantly, she was one of five, um, I don't know whether researchers or five academics who were invited to the United Nations to give a presentation during the 200th uh, slave trade anniversary. That is in 2007. Prof, why are you so passionate about the diaspora? I am because um, Africa is, or Afri when you talk about Africans, you're talking about those of us who live on the continent and those who live elsewhere. Okay. And I feel it is very important always to keep these two in mind. And also to ask yourself, it's like a, a family that is uh, separated. So you want to find out what happened and what, what you can do now. Um, my work with world learning um, was focused on, the, on issues in the African diaspora and that deepened an interest I had already. You know, you live in Cape Coast, you have the Cape Coast Castle. The Elmina Castle is close by, you're driving, there's an Amsterdam fort in Cormancy and so on. And it just raises very interesting questions for you. What are these buildings? How old are they? You know, for how long have they been there? And how come I don't know anything about them? And um, maybe teaching the Victorian novel. I remember when I was asked to teach the Victorian novel, I was so angry. I was asking myself, you know, what, what do we have to do with Victorian people when we don't even know enough about Ghanaian literature? But then there's a certain pattern that you see at the end of the Victorian novel, and you see that everybody is going abroad. And you ask yourself, what is abroad and who are these people? And you also ask yourself, so the, the current style of education that you have, that you call formal education, when, when did it come here? What was happening? Where it was sent from? You know, so these questions um, answer many, many things for you. But focusing directly on the African diaspora is just, you know, these buildings, are they, they connect us with some people who are they how did they live you know where are they what happened and they are the kinds of questions you ask just for to satisfy yourself it's not the research you do i wasn't doing this research for promotion i didn't i wasn't doing this research to go to the united nations i didn't even know who knew so it's one of the big surprises when i received the letter and I think a, a bigger surprise was earlier on, maybe about 2004 or so, when I'd been uh, um, invited to uh, a conference in Senegal. And that was the first time I talked about the research I was doing. And it attracted a lot of attention. And I got to meet so many top historians in the area I didn't even know existed at the time. You know, so. Um, it is just that, and then we also had Panafest. You know, there are so many things that makes you wonder, you know, who are we, what have we become, and then, you know, also being in literature, you read all these novels. And there's one particular incident I want to refer to, maybe two. One was when I was reading the novels of Roger Maes, he's a Jamaican writer, okay. and the, even the language, in some of the novels, Mpabwa was there, Dokuno was there. So the, the local Ghanaian. Yeah. Is, so, you know, you know it, it really, really yes. raised my, mm. my uh, imagination. You know, wondering, uh, what is this language doing so far away from home? And then the other incident was I had a friend called Rose. And when I had my first child, the one I said was born in October, okay. Rose okay. Okay. came to visit and I gave the baby to her. And I think the baby had hiccups, and Rose was fumbling with a straw, and I was just watching her, I mean, with a shawl. And she took a straw out of the, or a string of thread out the, of the, the baby's the, shawl the, okay. and put it on the baby's fontanel. Mm. And I was totally shocked. And I said, what is this? Because she's Jamaican. And she said, oh, that's how we stop uh, baby hiccups. And I said, that's exactly what we, we do. We do in Africa. So you see, the, the, the connection, yeah. It became very, very strong mm. at the time, mm. and I became very, very curious. Mm. About, because it mm. wasn't in my syllabus, it wasn't, mm. you know, I've been to, I've been, my secondary school was in Cape Coast. I went to the University of Cape Coast. Nowhere 
in my education had any reference been made to the okay. castle and I thought you know as I grew up and as I became more mature and I thought about these questions I realized that there was a big big part of our life mm. you know living outside of the continent that we had not paid as much attention to so I was also interested in those on the other side okay. how much of Africa do they also know and what is the source of that knowledge so, do, so do, on and so forth do you think Africa is attracting the diaspora we should attract each other it should be is a two-way two stream yes okay. it's a two-way stream it's not one person waiting for another to attract them we should attract each other you know if we if we begin to see each in the other I think we'll make some progress okay and if we begin to do the hard hard research for ourselves instead of some of us reading only the accounts of the victor we will go nowhere yeah. Yeah. but there are two categories of diasporas that I think I know of those who for lack of a better word I would say the brain drainers who would just leave the shores of Africa and go elsewhere and will stay there or and perhaps naturalize and there are those who may be due to slavery but have been born there how can we attract the academic diaspora to Africa we, can, we should attract everybody whether it's academic or non-academic if they have a sense of home but I'll talk about the two categories later professionals or whether they are incredible story <laughs> why did you choose this topic who told the most incredible yes. story? And what is in that story? <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, um, a collection of folk tales. Okay. First, I wanted to do like one big bedside table, bedside book. But the publishers drew my attention that putting is a 47 stories into one book wow. was just so clumsy. You wrote 47 books? Yeah, no, uh, stories. And the stories. So they decided to make it in five volumes, each about nine or ten or eleven, you know. Uh, Who Told the Most Incredible Story is one of the stories. And it's a distinctive kind of folk tale because it gives the reader or the listener three very difficult options. Okay, very, very difficult options. And the audience is left baffled and they'll be arguing and arguing and never agreeing. And it is decisively taken. I, you know, it, it, it is just telling us that nobody can be so right, everybody is wrong. Yeah. Nobody can be so wrong, everybody is right. It's a question of tolerance. It's a question of listening to each other. It's a question of respecting other perspectives. You know, because if you said it was a fly, somebody would say it's a mosquito. Mm -hmm. So we have different perspectives. It doesn't make us enemies. And I feel it's a fine story to teach children about the principles of democracy, of the principles of different perspectives coming together to make a fine story. And I believe in the folk tale not because um, I'm, uh, I teach African literature, which will be a legitimate reason, but I also believe that you know you can use literature to teach any subject at all you want. Mm. You can use it to teach math, you can use it to teach science, you can use it to teach uh, what, what, what can religion, biology, anything. Okay, so, th so the folk tale underscores the power and relevance of literature, which is my discipline. And your other discipline okay. is French. Well, well, it's also language. It's also, it's also, it's also language. French literature, you know, literature written in English, Ghanaian literature, oh. you know. So it underscores how extremely important the story is. And you know children like stories. And if you teach anyone through a method he can relate to and a method he likes, 50% of your work is done. Okay. Okay, so, uh, you know, but the, the stories didn't begin with this. It started as something... I was doing it with my own children and at the time I didn't even think I was doing a book. It was just something I was writing for them to read. To read. Because as a teacher that's all I can do is to teach my children to read. So what should we expect from Professor Jane Nanopukwa in ten years time in terms of 
writing stories for grandchildren and <laughs> children. Oh, what the, f the five <laughs> volumes will be enough for the grandchildren? No, people are asking me, so when are we getting the sixth volume? When are we getting the sixth volume? Because they are very, very active. <laughs> very active. Well, I don't know, maybe uh, right now, I'm doing a lot of writing now. Mm. Um, I don't know how it will end up. Um, I'm still shaping it. I'm still adding to it. Maybe it will come out as, an, as a biography or as, a, as an autobiography, but I want it to be of a different format. So I read a lot of biographies and I want this to be very, very different. And I also want it to be as, maybe quote unquote, as natural as possible. I don't think that memory is chronological. No. Okay, so I'm not looking forward to the biography that says I was born here and this is my childhood. It will all be part of it. If I ask you to remember something in your past, I'm sure it may not be the earliest memories. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, I rest here. So I haven't approached a publisher yet because I wanted to get to a certain shape so we can talk more okay. than... Uh, so my, my very final question before we wrap up, who is Professor Jin Nana Bokwajima mentoring? Consciously, like our people are mentoring. Yes. You know, this whole thing about role model really unnerves me because um, you become a model to somebody. I think it's awesome and I think it's almost frightening um, in the sense that if somebody is so motivated by what you have done, I think you should put you on the alert. You know, you should really, really put you on alert to ensure you are not messing up in the first place and to ensure that, you know, as a teacher, you are there to share, you are there to encourage, you are there to support, and um, you do that both consciously and unconsciously. Some approach you, they want advice on this or that, and I'm very careful about giving advice. I normally uh, talk about what I would do in that situation and allow you to make up your own your mind. Decision rather than to say, do this, uh -huh. you know. Mm. Uh, because mm. if you're not careful, you can also interfere with people's confidence. And then they'll feel if they don't come to you, then they can't make a decision. But they can. Uh, decisions are not always good. You just hope they won't destroy you, but you can learn from the experience of that decision, depending on the outcomes, mm. you know, so. Viewers, as we normally say, a good conversation never ends. We've had such an engaging engagement with Professor Jinana Upukwaji. So welcome back to the round table on the impact of the corona crisis. Uh, this next hour is uh, a bit more action oriented. First, we'll hear from uh, three students about their experiences, and then we'll launch into discussion. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll not take um, questions directly to, to the students, but make that part of the discussion. So please, if you have questions for them, uh, take note of them somewhere so you don't forget, so we can have a useful and lively uh, discussion. Uh, to introduce this section, I've asked uh, my colleague, he's an uh, extraordinary professor here at the Nordic Africa Institute, 
Um, and when we had um, an advisory meeting about this roundtable, he insisted there has to be student perspectives, and I'll leave to him to explain why that is so important. Thanks so much, Kaisa, and uh, welcome everyone. It's a little bit absurd almost that the oldest participant, meaning me, I am as old as I look, uh, opens now the round with the contributions by the three youngest participants in that chat. Um, but I think age does not really matter when it comes to tackling social challenges and problems. Uh, while I think I'm a dinosaur, I hope that my mindset is a current one. And uh, while I cannot preempt what the three students have to say, and I'm very keen to listen, uh, because uh, especially my age group should learn not to talk as much as we do, but to listen more, uh, and then think twice before we talk, I would like to share a few concerns which uh, basically contribute uh, in a nutshell to the debate and they engage on two levels with uh, knowledge, knowledge production and knowledge transmission and I think the one is class and the other one is the meaning of knowledge. Now what do I mean and I have just three and a half minutes left. This class I mean there are social inequalities in existence. And we don't have to go back to Pierre Bourdieu, who stressed that as an important contribution in the 60s on the nature of, in our current societies, institutionalized access to higher education and the transmission of knowledge can be used as an instrument to reduce class. But if we now are forced by circumstances to relocate education into the home and the environment conducive to learning is the one of a middle and upper class. So students who are now relegated back to a home environment are facing the disadvantages with life on campus to a certain extent can reduce, not eliminate but reduce. So I think we need to be aware of that. And the second aspect is the one of the so-called hidden curriculum. Pedagogy matters. And I believe that a transfer of humanist education, which I hope is the empathy and compassion, and that requires personal human interaction. While we can get along with a nice debate as of today, I strongly feel it cannot totally replace human interaction, which means eye-to-eye -eye interaction, which means empathy, which means emotions, which means feelings as part of a learning process and the transmission of knowledge. Knowledge is not a neutral affair. It means empowerment also in the sense of human empowerment. And it's very interesting that just now Silicon Valley jumps on the bandwagon and sees an opportunity to transfer what doing now. And an interesting comment in the New York Times magazine said, I quote, will, build, will big tech's entry into education reduce our humanity? And I think it's a challenge we are confronted with for the time in the post-corona uh, exceptional circumstances. And I think we should be aware of the force of circumstances we are confronted with but we should not throw out the baby with the bathwater. I would like to end with a quote from an article and I will share with all of you the links to two articles which I feel quite relevant in that context. It says, this article, technology doesn't fix social problems, people do. But deployed unreflectively, technology can reify or even enhance social differences and inequalities, locking into algorithms very human decisions that are biased as the social systems they automate. And I think that's the risk and the danger I see. But that Thank you for that introduction, Henning, and I'll call first on Claudia Essidentu. She's a final year student at private Ashesi University in Ghana, and I believe she does not have a camera. 
but we, we can hear from her. You have five minutes. We'll let you know when two minutes are left. All right. Thank you. As it's now reflection on how the coronavirus has affected me and what my school has done so far to, you know, deal with this new pandemic that has affected the whole world. I, for one, have been stuck in my room for months since schools closed down. Personally, I'm not much of an outing type. Um, but what is new is the feeling of restlessness that comes with knowing that you can't just go anywhere when you need to or what, when you want to due to the risk involved. I was set to graduate on May 30th before COVID-19. As an upcoming graduate, I had started seeing all these plans come to a halt. However, as a human, we are created and built to adapt to different situations. And I believe I have been coping pretty well and hoping the world will soon overcome this pandemic. For my university, Ashesi University, had, the school has done pretty well in successfully adapting its curriculum to incorporate new changes as a result of the COVID-19. The school has successfully moved all of its lectures online, making use of the Zoom app and Canvas for its teaching and learning. Also, the school has made arrangements with telecommunication companies to supply monthly into joint lectures on Zoom and Canvas everywhere that we need to interact with our lecturers but I'm monitoring the process. But I do know that there are issues with access to online learning for undergraduate students and for PhD students in their first year. At my university, the first year is when you do coursework. So the, the crisis hit in the middle of the second semester for uh, uh, most of these students. And I know that they've had challenges. And one of the comments that came uh, from the, my, the PhD group that I was talking about is from Omolara in Nigeria. And she says, I'm reading, transition to e-learning is not working for some students. Some universities either don't have the right infrastructure or the lecturers are not well prepared to run online classes. And this echoes some of the things that were said earlier. The second issue area for me has been my field work. I was due to go to Lagos in March to do the final leg of data collection. What I've done, how I've tried to manage this is substituting the in-person for digital interviews and that raises three issues. Activity. I've had connectivity on my end and connectivity on the end of the participants that I'm talking to. I have had interviews where Skype wouldn't work at that point. So I've had interviews where Skype was working so badly that I had to resort to WhatsApp. And I couldn't do a, a call because the, the other person's connectivity was bad. And so what we ended up doing was using voice notes. And you can imagine how stressful that was, having to wait for the person to answer and then listen before you can ask another question. The interview took three hours. It should have taken 45 minutes. And the other issue also is by doing it this way, you're thinking for when and whether I can publish it. So it has implications for my writing process. So I think since I have two minutes, I'll just go back to where I started. And talk. Hi again. I say that uh, I'm a PhD student. Uh, I started this year. I'm enrolled in the course uh, that Prof. Stennis is giving now about uh, democracy and the uh, uh, public engagement in anthropology uh, related to from my experience uh, it has been uh, it, it is an unexpected situation because uh, I was uh, possible to do the course um, in general uh, some students that have limitations to have lessons in this kind of platforms because some of them uh, do uh, come to university, but they don't have computer, or if, if, if they have, they uh, still have some difficulties to use it. So it's something that we also uh, we are facing here. But uh, just to, to finish, I have to say that uh, we are uh, people are trying to do their best to have lessons from WhatsApp uh, and from email. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marcia, for sharing your uh, experiences uh, so far. Sad that you cannot be with us here in Sweden at the moment, but hopefully we'll get to see you um, 
sometime soon. Um, I wanted us to launch into discussion. Uh, as we prepare to do so, I'd like to first call on uh, Grace Idahosa, who's a visiting scholar here at NINE at this point. If you want to share your experiences too, I think are quite interesting uh, with, with how COVID has affected you and your uh, research that is also on higher education. So maybe you want to say one or two words. After Grace comes in, uh, Desire had a question for Stian that was never addressed. Uh, it was about uh, pedagogy being um, during lockdown. How can it be improved? If you wanted to expand on that, Stian. And after that, I'm going to open the floor. So please uh, write here. I see names being added to the group chat. So so we'll, we'll take it from there. First, Grace and then Stian. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, um, Kaiser. Um, I'm not sure where to start, but <laughs> I think the first thing um, to say is that at the moment I am stuck um, in terms of not being able to go back home. So um, there are no flights and, and anything. And um, for some reason, I didn't prepare my mind for that. Um, I just thought when 15th Friday, I'm out of here, I can go back and get back um, into my, my work. Um, or at least settle down before getting back, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So um, now I am trying to um, rearrange my life in terms of um, this week, for instance, I decided, okay, I need to start going to the office because I have um, deadlines that I have to. We are not able to extend these deadlines even if the situations are um, difficult. So I am working on um, a report now that I have to send in um, tomorrow, sorry, today is Thursday, yeah, 115 Friday. And um, um, that can not be pushed. Um, yeah, apart from that, um, I think it's, another thing that's been challenging is the, oh, and partly surprising for me, is the um, mental health um, effects of this. Um, it's not something that you really think about um, because as academics, we are naturally, uh, prone to um, isolation and to being in our own silos and all those things. So you think, oh, it's fine. Anyways, it's like every other day for me. But there is something about that freedom being taken away from you, um, where you, you're not the one making the decision to, um, to stay at home or lock yourself for like one or two weeks in some, um, without talking to people or meeting people face to face. And um, yeah, that's been... Um, difficult. I mean, I've always said, mm, I don't like people anyways, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't need to see people. And then um, in the last three, four weeks, I've realized that I actually do um, cherish the face-to-face -face meetings in the office and everything. Um, in relation to my work, um, that's been a little bit, I think, more challenging because, um, so it spills over from the mental and emotional issues to being able to work. And um, being able to uh, to uh, do things at the same capacity or level that you were doing them before doing before the um, um, pandemic started, and um, that's been difficult. I don't know. I don't have. I don't think I've been able to um, provide a solution for myself. Uh, now I'm just trying different things. And um, I think the last thing I want to talk about is my. Um, the actual work that I do. So my research focuses on agency um, uh, in relation to transforming higher education. And in the last few weeks, I've had to think about um, the impact of the move to e-learning and the impact of um, digitization on, um, um, say, the transformation or even just the higher education context in general. And just side note, my research is mainly focused on South African higher education and um, some of the things I've been thinking about that um, higher education institutions in South Africa face because uh, there is the, there is an um, intersection of race and class in terms of who has who has access um, at the university level at the level of the academic at the level of the student also um, of who has um, access to be able to participate in these um, online learning, um, uh, in, in online learning processes. First place, they do not have the um, 
necessary infrastructure, some of them um, set up to um, be able to make that move, that um, smooth um, transition. Um, so for instance, some um, lecturers are still giving their notes, um, uh, paper, paper um, course outlines, or they just send it via email. So they don't use like platforms like um, uh, Blackboard or Moodle and all these things, and that my primary interest. So I look, I try to understand um, academic staff agency to contribute to transformations, or I even whether they are staff or they occupy, um, um, whether they are academics or they occupy um, leadership um, positions within the within the university. And thank so you, my, thank sorry? you, Grace. Uh, I think it's your your research really is interesting because it looks at the nuts and bolts of transformation in the university and. And as you say, you, you might have to, you know, shift a little bit with the Corona crisis coming to land in your your lap. Literally, you've been very much affected personally, but I think also for for the academics and the staff that you study, uh, it's interesting to see how how COVID uh, affects their agency. I will uh, hand over to Stigan. There was a question for you, and you have also told us you have something you would like to bring up, so you can have some space to do both. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for the question. And uh, it was about what can be done of uh, pedagogic development during the corona. And I think that I echo what other people have said that, of course, this is how to make do in a complicated situation. I'm not saying that this is a, a true alternative. It's just thinking what, what can be done and how are PDF files and readings quite easily even though people are not upload, you have a problem with a connection, you can send text and, and tell people well you have to read the text in advance and then of course if you have power cut eventually hopefully the power will come back will be able to 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 be able to read it so so i think that that kind of kind of the the balance between on one hand a kind of <clears throat> direct teaching in uh, and talking and also having this kind of of preparatory aspect of the work uh, maybe and and also an experience that we learned long before COVID is is also not to use PowerPoints so much in this kind of medium, because PowerPoint eats a lot of um, capacity of internet. So I think I think you we I, this is not a, at all a comment to what happened today. I think it was great presentations, but I that instead of PowerPoint, you can share the PowerPoint in advance, you can send it or you, and so on, and try to be shorter, have more of interaction in your, in your talking. So I'm, I'm just thinking these are the things I think we can, we can learn from this very unpleasant experience. Then a, a final point, and I think many people have brought it up, it's, it's the WhatsApp groups. I tend to say that uh, an armed group that would like to, to affirm itself in uh, in the Malian turmoil, the first thing they do is to get a Twitter account or a WhatsApp app account. So in uh, social media are used in all these kind of groups. And I think that most of us, we have our smartphones, plenty of silly pictures and, si and things going on, what's going on. And I mean, you're connected in various ways. But if you create these kind of, using this kind of WhatsApp groups, we have a group in Messenger that we use. Uh, when we started, we just said, don't share, I mean, this kind of funny things, just share professional things. Having a kind of situation whereby uh, you, are not, you are not going to get this kind of conspiracy theory of, of being a bit disciplined from what you are sharing. Because somebody who is dealing with corona or are quiz questioning so and so, well, then after a while you will have people leaving the group. And all this comes to uh, my, my comment. And I think this is maybe where the Association of African University, together with us, could, could make a difference. And that is to push for open access. And not just open access in the sense of opening up a little or doing a kind of marketing uh, campaign, but really push for open access. So that when these things are available, when the articles are available, that we can use them. And uh, uh, I, I think that that is one of the kind of main things, not a miracle, and uh, to push the 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 big the big tech tech technology technological corporations of Silicon Valley, as as Henning said. So I think there there is something there, 
my last point about uh, in the response or, or connection to what uh, uh, Gras or Grace said uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, I fully sense about this loneliness and so on. And what we have done with my two PhD students from Mozambique in Uppsala living in small studios is that given that we don't have a complete confinement in, in Sweden, we have started walk and talk supervision. So we are walking outdoors. So we are walking to Gamla Uppsala, we are walking in the forest or we are walking and, uh, and uh, as a way to have a kind of meaningful social interaction. Because I think we have good reasons to be very worried what this make, happens to us psychologically and socially. And uh, even more so if you are not uh, at home. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Stian. Is that close to, um, to your department or if Grace or anyone else would like to, to join? Is it like one-on-one -on -one or it's a group? Absolutely. We can walk to Gamla Uppsala together. Gras. That's lovely. Grace, did you hear that? I want to hand over um, to Mireille. She had a, a comment. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Justin, and everyone for those presentations. It's not really a comment, but just to, uh, to, to ask a, a question. A question, yes, uh, about uh, electricity shortage. I, I, I would like to know, maybe be more, uh, to know, yes, know if it's a particular problem in in Cameroon or in Central Africa, or there are other states uh, in uh, Africa that face the same problem. Because I think without electricity access, uh, we can't have access to internet. So it's just a question I'm addressing to to university staff, uh, academics of uh, other places in Africa, just to know to have a view. Compare and compare. Is it uh, how does it work in South Africa or West Africa? Because here in Central Africa, in in Cameroon particular, it's a great, great problem. Almost all the regions are affected about that, and we have been really affected during this particular pandemic uh, context. So that's all the what I want to know. Yes. So so let's have a few voices on that. Maybe Nodomo, would you like to say something about power? issues maybe across okay uh, thank you um i think it's an african problem um, many many countries face that problem and i think one of the things that we keep reflecting on is how we can take advantage of alternative continent to begin to make sure that people are not falling into depression or all these kinds of things, because this is a tough situation for all of us. Thank you. This crisis seems to be a lot about balancing uh, interests. I mean, it's the health interest versus the livelihood interest, and it's also the COVID uh, risks versus the mental health risks. Okay, so I just wanted, it's not about power. I just wanted to flag something that came up on Twitter. I've been tweeting um, certain parts of this conversation. And somebody just commented that universities in Nigeria, some of them apparently are ch charging students extra for online classes, and the amounts are as high as five hundred dollars. I just want um, aspect. I I heard from from other parts of the world, students are demanding their fees back because online classes they feel is is on a different level and should be charged as um um an university education in person that when it goes offline. Um, thank you for sharing that, Titi Lopez. So Henning is next. It relates to that because uh, there is a material aspect to online teaching. And it's not only access to power, it's access to internet and the costs of having access to internet, depending on where you are. And in some rural areas, I know it from South Africa and from Namibia, students who have been relocated back home to their 